Uh, my name is Federico Ardila, and I am a professor at San Francisco State University in California. Uh, and I'm also an adjunct professor at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, which is where I'm originally from. Uh, and I also hold this, the, this position as director of MSRI UP, which is this uh, summer uh, research program for uh, underrepresented students in mathematics uh, at the Mathematical Science Research Institute in Berkeley. I've been uh, quarantined in Colombia, which is, which is uh, you know, my, my childhood home and, and talking a lot to my parents. And I, I just want to share two stories with you. Uh, first story that my dad was, ha has been telling that I didn't know is that apparently when I was a kid and I was learning how to add, uh, he, we were just driving in the car and he just asked me, Federico, what is one plus two plus three plus four up to nine? Uh, and then I told him, oh, okay, one plus nine is 10, two plus eight is 10, three plus seven is 10. 4 plus 6 is 10, and 5, that's 45. Uh, a different childhood story that my parents always used to tell is that when I was a kid, I was really fast at solving Rubik's Cube. I have to admit that today I, I don't know how to solve a Rubik's Cube, so I had to confront this question and just ask, hey, you know, how, how, how come? We realized that what I did is that I just showed them a Rubik's Cube that was scrambled up. I ran into the other room, I took it apart, put it back together in the right order, and I said, look, I could solve the Rubik's Cube. Uh, and I guess I, I, I share them to say that I, I was seen as a talented kid uh, and that that's a kind of a messy thing, this idea of, of talent. And I, I think, you know, I, I definitely was seen as talented and so I was nurtured and there were a lot of resources for me. I think not every father is asking their kid as they're driving in the car for like a cool math question. Even though as a kid, I, I love math, I didn't really understand or, or what, you know, that there was a career called mathematics and I didn't really know what, what, what that entailed. And I guess I kept, I kept taking math classes because I liked them, but, I, but I, didn't, I didn't set out to be a mathematician. Even as an undergraduate, I was kind of confused about what I wanted to do. And I, I tried engineering, I found it too hard, to be honest. And I tried physics, I found it too hard. And I liked philosophy and music, other things. Um, but, uh, but I just kept taking math classes. And, I, and one thing that happened is that I took these really beautiful classes in combinatorics from uh, professors, uh, Sergei Fomin and uh, Richard Stanley. And I was just enamored by this. And I just, I just love the material so much that I, that I said, okay, this is what seals it. And I think I'm gonna, if, it sounds like this is something that I can keep doing for the rest of my life. And so that's, that sounds pretty cool. As you might've guessed from the previous answer, I ended up working in combinatorics, which is ironic because actually I found combinatorics incredibly hard and it was the subject that I liked the least because I found it way too hard. Somehow I, I was stubborn enough that I really wanted to learn it. And, and that's what I ended up doing. So what is combinatorics? Uh, some people say combinatorics is about counting. Uh, I don't think that's very accurate. Um, I guess one way that I like to describe it is that if you want to count this, the cells in a chessboard, you don't go one, two, three, you realize, oh, they have a structure. They're, they're in an eight by eight square. And because of that structure, I can count them as eight times eight. And in combinatorics, a lot of what we do is, is basically trying to understand structure. Or what I do more is, is, is see how that actually plays out in a lot of fields of mathematics. So I like situations in algebra and geometry and topology where you have this very messy information that you have to organize. And, you know, how, what are the pieces? How are they related to each other? And by understanding that structure, we can say something about these objects. So this is, I guess, a lot of what I do. Of course, everybody has difficulties and struggles, uh, but, but I think I, I have to admit that I, I've had it comparatively easy given that you know, I, I grew up being the majority here. I, you know, I, was, I was male, I was, I was middle class from a, from a good school academically. It was kind of assumed that a mathematician looked like me when I was in Colombia. It was interesting moving abroad to the US and all of a sudden turning into a minority. And you know, we could talk for hours about what, what that means, but. Um, but having said that, I think, I think one, of my, one of my struggles has always been just uh, that I'm always interested in just broadening what does it mean to be a mathematician. Uh, and I really like this way that Rochelle Gutierrez describes it. Uh, she's a professor of math education at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and she talks about how it's really important that we, that we learn how to play the game and also how to change the game. And I really like how she, she draws this thing where like, you know, she, she says the, the play the game axis is here, the change the game axis is here, and right in the middle is something that she calls Nepantla. It's a Nahuatl world and it, it's a Nahuatl word and it was used a lot by uh, Chicana feminists to talk about something like the space in between where in their case it was somehow being like half Mexican, half 
uh, American, but somehow being in between and not seen as fully Mexican or fully American. And I, I guess that's something that I've always felt a little bit that somehow I think I'm seen as, as a mathematician that has the best strong research. And I think I'm also seen as, as a mathematician that is very interested in outreach and teaching. And actually the value systems are completely different in these two, in these two worlds. And I always find myself really struggling with how do you, how do I bridge that and, and uh, you know, doing things that are valued in one place are not valued in the other and, and so on. And sometimes it's actually difficult in our, in our academic world to like really put yourself in the middle, which is where I want to be. And, and the Chicana feminist will tell you it's an uncomfortable space. It's a space of growth. And that's where I like to be. Uh, but somehow our academic spaces are not always designed for us to do that kind of work. I'm doing some work right now that I'm actually really proud of. And, it's, and I, I feel like it's pretty cool when they tell you that math is like a young person's game. And as I was telling you, it, it's taken me many years to, to actually go from more of a kind of a uh, problem solving, quick kind of thing, which is I think what's valued by our education system to like really be able to stick with a, with a project for five, 10 years and, and do something. And I feel like in that sense, I'm doing the best work of my life and that's really exciting. And it's interesting because at the same time, even though I love this and, and it's very meaningful to me, it's, it's actually not, the field, the, not what I feel the strongest about. And I think actually what I'm proudest of is, is, is that in this place of discomfort that I was just talking about, I, I feel like I've, I've been able to, to at least learn a lot from, from, from sitting in that space of just like, what does it mean to, to, to broaden mathematics, to do it a little bit differently and, and to, you know, wh while my research is regarded as, as good, also, also trying to push for, for other things. So I'm really proud of my students. I love mentoring students. I, I've mentored about 50 pieces students and it's just really cool to, you know, now if I'm stuck in a math problem, I know which student to call and they're going to know the answer. And that's just a really cool feeling. I've been able to help build a lot, a lot of com like a, a community approach to mathematics that is more comfortable to me than, than the more individualistic approach that I first found when I moved to the U.S. Uh, we have this meaning called Eco Encuentro Colombiano de Combinatoria, which is not just uh, Colombiano, but it's but it's uh, it's supposed to be a, a space where we do like really strong mathematics, but that it just feels really good and really empowering to be there. And I, it, it really fills my heart in a way that actually just doing mathematics doesn't. I think another thing is is even just pushing my own comfort level about about speaking up because because in mathematics again you know it's it it's easier for you if you just quietly push your theorems and and not say more, but but I've always felt like there's some things that need to be said about our community and it was hella scary to do it, if I'm honest with you. I've written a couple of papers uh, that were very uncomfortable for me. They were not math papers, but one is called the Todos Quentin, Building Diversity in Combinatorics. Another one is called Geometry, Robots and Society. Uh, and in these two papers, I was really trying to, to articulate what is the teaching that we do? How, what is the service that we do to our community? What is the effect of our mathematics and society as a whole? And it took me a many many years to be comfortable enough and, and you know we're mathematicians and we're perfectionists and we want to get it right so i've been like reading and learning and, and just trying to be able to find the, the words to say some things that i wanted to say and it's felt really good and really uncomfortable and satisfying to to put some of those uh, thoughts out there one of the earliest people that i owe a lot to is uh mary falk de losada uh, she is uh, an American woman who moved to Colombia many years ago and started the Math Olympia program. A, a very large percentage of, of those of us in my generation that are doing academic mathematics come from that program. And um, as I became a faculty member, I have to say, and uh, you know, it might sound cheesy, but it's totally true that actually it's been my students that I've learned so much from. They've taught me a lot uh, about what it can be to, to be a mathematician. As I was saying, I, I came as an international Latino student. Um, and now I am seen as one of the minority mathematicians of this country. And, and I've learned a lot from being in these spaces and, and uh, talking to, you know, a lot of the uh, first Chicano faculty in, in, uh, in U.S. departments, a, a, lot of, a lot of faculty from historical black colleges and universities. And they've just been huge mentors. They've also set me straight when I have uh, had things unclear in my mind. And I think that I've learned a lot from them. And they've been really great mentors for, for what it means to, to be a, a faculty. I find it very hard to like offer blanket advice without having a conversation with you, whoever you are on the other side of this video, because there isn't universal advice. There's, there's this thing where somehow professors feel like it's our job to be, to like decide who's cut out for mathematics and who's not. And too many people that I know have had to hear a professor saying, you know what, you're never gonna achieve this or you don't have what it takes to do this. 
And you know what? You don't know that. You don't know who this person is. You don't know their story. You don't know what's going on in their life. And, and, and that I feel is pretty universal advice to faculty is just don't do that. You don't, you don't know. You don't know the person you're talking to. And if you're a student and you hear that kind of advice, try, try to see what there is to be learned from it, but don't listen to it. You know, take, take what's useful and then know that this person doesn't know you. Maybe I'll just tell you two stories of my trajectory that I think have taught me something. When I applied to college, I was actually failing almost every subject. And, uh, and when it came time to apply for colleges, one of my friends said, hey, there's this school uh, that in the U.S. that is really good at science and, and they have really good financial aid. And he really wanted to apply. And so he convinced me to apply. And I had never heard of this place. And in the end, I ended up getting in. And this was MIT. Uh, and it's interesting because I, I had never heard of MIT. And I think if I knew that MIT was this like, very prestigious place, I would have known that of course, they weren't going to admit me because I was failing almost every, everything. And I think in that case, my ignorance helped me to not close that door on myself because I think if I had known, I wouldn't have applied. And so this is one thing that, I've, that I've, I think I've learned from that. It's just like, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not for you to close doors for yourself because, there, you know, there's plenty of people and plenty of structures that are going to close doors on you and, and you cannot be one of them. You, you, your job is to open the door and then try to push as hard as you can and see if you're able to get in. And I think the other thing is that when, when I got to MIT, it was interesting just getting there and, and just finding it to be such a cultural clash with who I was and where I came from and just like, what were my values? And, and so there was kind of a, like an ideological clash with the place, but, but more than anything, a cultural clash. And one, and one thing is just that there was just this complete obsession with work. There was this glorification of like, oh, I haven't slept in three days because, I, because I've been doing my, my homework. I was not going to do that. And I, and I think that if I had gone that route, it, it would have just been, I don't think I had the language for like understanding that this would be a disaster for my mental health and that, and that, that just wouldn't have worked. Somehow it was important for me to like, you know, play football like every night. And <laughs> I joked that I did my PhD in, in salsa because I was obsessed with like, I've always, you know, Colombians they love salsa and I was obsessed and I spent a lot of time doing that. And that's when I started DJing and playing music and, all of that to say that I think for me, it's, it's work to try to understand what is, what is my own path. And that, that doesn't mean to be completely stubborn and, and not understand what are the realities that you're, that you're facing. And it's a little bit of that play of the game thing. Like you, you gotta, you gotta know how to play the game and also jump through the hoops. But, but I think it's also important to know that, that you have to find your way of doing things. And that sometimes just because everybody else is doing things in a certain way, doesn't mean that that has to work for you and that's okay. 